Good evening. You're watching the news at 7.30 on ATV. I'm Raymond Young. And I'm Edna Zia. Here's a look at tonight's top stories. Student leaders threaten to escalate protests despite growing backlash and division among the demonstrators. Chaos in Hong Kong as Occupy protesters turn on police and turn vigilante. Siwa Leung spills the beans on tear gassing the Occupy rally and his controversial financial deal. It's been two weeks since protesters began their civil disobedience campaign, and there seems to be no end to the occupation of Admiralty, Mong Kok and Causeway Bay. The Federation of Students has threatened to escalate their action if the government refuses to give a timetable on real universal suffrage and amend its report on constitutional development. Protesters continued the civil disobedience movement in prime locations across the territory today. In Admiralty, Connaught Road Central has been turned into a camping site filled with colorful tents set up by protesters. Tours are even being arranged for young children at the site. From what? This mother said the activity allows children to have a better understanding of what's happening. I've been to the protest site before, but I wanted to show my kids what it's all about. And for them, because what they read in the papers is all about the tear gas and the demonstration, and they find it a bit fearful. And I think it was a, a good learning experience. There was a similar scene in Causeway Bay, with many protesters camping out at the protest site. There are no signs when the protesters will leave, and some say they are determined to stay. Several Eastern District councillors visited the scene this afternoon and asked them to stop their sit-in as soon as possible. But the protesters were unmoved by the argument that they are affecting the livelihood of the locals and nearby businesses. In Mong Kok, minor scuffles and quarrels broke out throughout the day. Police were called in after some Federation of Students members arrived at the scene. Many of the protesters told them to leave because they said the group doesn't represent them. The protesters accused the Federation of attempting to take control of the leaderless movement after the student group tried to hold a forum to gather views on how to sustain themselves. Although there are signs that control of the Occupy movement is slipping out of the hands of the student leaders, the Federation insisted today that it could step up its action if the government fails to meet its demands. Deputy General Secretary Lester Shum said the government should be blamed for the deadlock. Shum said students are willing to meet officials if they change the constitutional development report, which they claim does not reflect the views of the people, and set a timetable for real universal suffrage. Shum added that although Chief Executive Lun Chen-ying said he did not order tear gas to be used on protesters, he should be responsible for the political saga and not the police. Speaking in Guangzhou, Constitutional Development Secretary Raymond Tam denied Shum's claim that the government did not paint an accurate picture for Beijing of the city's view of electoral reform and that it's unfair to blame the government for the current political impasse. Tam said student protesters occupying the streets should instead think about what they need to do next as the future of Hong Kong is in their hands. Admiralty, the main protest area for Occupy Central, was calm throughout the night. But over in Mong Kok, it was a completely different story. Occupy protesters turned on police officers they accused of attacking them, while others appeared on the verge of meeting our vigilante justice after witnessing a car crash. And Chen reports. <laughs> Tensions rose in Mong Kok at around 4 a.m. when protesters tried to add more barricades to their blockade near Bank Center on Nathan Road, but were stopped by police. Arguments turned into scuffles. One man was taken away by several policemen, which angered many. As police were trying to break up the crowd, a woman accused one of the officers of molesting her. This angered protesters even further. Another man claimed he'd been hit. It's this man, he assaulted me. He hit me. He hit me. 
He then tried to film the officer who allegedly attacked him. Oh, are you trying to not let me receive his face? He later had a seizure and collapsed onto the ground. Medics arrived and took him to Kwangwa Hospital. More scuffles broke out as the angry mob berated the police. There was no escape for the officers, who were tailed by protesters all the way back to Mangkok Police Station via Sai Yi and Fai Yun Streets. There was more chaos later on in what at first was an unrelated incident involving a car driving into the back of a taxi on Prince Edward Road West. Protesters surrounded the car in what appeared to be their attempt to take the law into their own hands. The driver tried to get away, but he was stopped. Police rushed to get the protesters away from the car. The driver refused to get out and made a second attempt to drive away. Officers then broke the car's windows with batons and the driver was pulled out and arrested. The cabbie said the man drove into his taxi three times. Police confiscated both cars and are investigating the incident. In stark contrast, Admiralty, the protest hub, was calm as people camped out in a sea of tents. And Chang, ATV News. Chief Executive Lan Chenying has again dismissed rumors that he is stepping down for his handling of the Occupy Central protests. He also spoke about his controversial deal with an Australian firm and shed light on the decision to tear gas Occupy protesters. After vanishing from the media's cameras for nearly 10 days, Hong Kong's embattled chief executive finally broke his silence today when he appeared on television this morning. Despite calls for his resignation, Lun Chenying quickly dismissed rumors that he will step down to account for the government's handling of the Occupy Central protests, which have now entered their third week. I have never thought of resigning, Lun said. The Occupy demonstrators are asking Beijing to withdraw its political reform plans and to let ordinary voters nominate chief executive candidates, he explained. Those demands are not only unattainable, but won't be achieved with my resignation. He warned student leaders there is zero chance that talks will yield any result if they refuse to accept two prerequisites, that discussions must conform to the basic law and the decision of the National People's Congress Standing Committee. Leung stressed that his government has all along exercised maximum tolerance towards the protests and understands the student's position, but will not shirk from its responsibility of enforcing the law. And for the first time, Leung spoke about the police deploying tear gas against protesters a fortnight ago, a move that appeared to give the movement extra momentum, instead of containing it, as well as grabbing global attention. Leung denied telling the police to use tear gas, saying he relied on the professional judgment of the police commander at the site. That said, he was involved in the whole process, including the decision to stop using the canisters after 87 of them were deployed. Asked if and when the police will take action and restore order, Leung said that will be the very last resort. For now, Leung believes, the protesters should reflect on their actions, particularly the disturbances caused by the occupation of main roads around Hong Kong. Is it right if small businesses wind down and workers lose their jobs because of their fight for democracy? Leung asked. As to fresh allegations that he received huge secret payments from an Australian firm, he denied he broke any financial rules. Australian media revealed last week that Leung had pocketed $50 million from engineering company UGL between 2012 and 2013 after he took office. Leung pointed out that the contract only stated his property consultant firm DTZ, which was insolvent at the time, could not compete with UGL, and he has not provided any services to UGL since then. He believes there was no need to declare the income since the deal was struck before he was sworn in. As we enter the third week of protests, many people are getting increasingly fed up with them. Various groups rallied against the pro-democracy protesters today, urging them to clear the roads so business and traffic can get back to normal. And Jiang reports. Hey! Hey!
Almost 300 members of the Justice Alliance and the Blue Ribbon Movement gathered in Tim Sha Choi today to rally against pro-democracy protesters and show their support for the police force. Led by Letitia Lee, they chanted slogans and waved banners and threatened to besiege the protesters if they don't clear the streets by Tuesday. We have to gain back uh, the streets and uh, the public areas for the citizens in Hong Kong. And uh, we can see that you know this is the 14th day I know, of the Occupy Central. And uh, we received lots of complaint letters you know, from the Hong Kong and Causeway-based uh, civilians. So this is really a damage for the economy and the international image of Hong Kong. Arguments broke out between the marchers and the pro-democracy protesters. The Occupy supporters fired back jeers and denounced the march. The protest ended at McPherson Playground and the group dispersed. In a separate protest, at least 30 taxi drivers from the Motor Transport Workers General Union marched from police headquarters on Arsenal Street to government headquarters in Admiralty. They raised banners and chanted slogans, demanding roads be cleared because their business has been affected. As you know, how can we keep on to make our business? Most tax drivers, their income already dropped down more than 40 percent. They have to support their family, right? We have to eat rice. That's why we are so angry. We ask for the people to go home. That's the way. To fight for freedom and democracy is not to break the law in Hong Kong. Many threatened to remove the roadblocks themselves if necessary. Meanwhile, members of a group called Caring Hong Kong Power showed up at police headquarters in Wan Chai to show their support for the police force in dealing with pro-democracy protesters. Anne Chang, ATV News. The police said today that the decision to use tear gas against protesters two weeks ago was to avert possible casualties or even a stampede. The spokesman also claimed pepper spray was ineffective against demonstrators who put on face masks and cling film. Hours after Chief Executive Leung Chen Ying distanced himself from tear gassing protesters two weeks ago, the heat was on the police as questions over whether excessive force was used remain unanswered. Chief Superintendent Steve Ho from the Forces Public Relations Branch said it was the on-site commander who made the call to fire tear gas, which hasn't been used on locals since the 1967 riots. He stopped short of saying whether top government officials intervened in the operation, which calls into question the independence and integrity of the police. But Ho doesn't believe there was anything wrong with using tear gas. It was to avert possible casualties or even a stampede had the situation gone on. Pepper spraying protesters was not effective as many were wearing face masks or cling film, Ho claimed. So tear gas was thrown to create a safe distance between the demonstrators and officers. Other government departments, meanwhile, continue to paint a gloomy picture of life in Hong Kong during the Occupy Central campaign. Assistant Transport Commissioner Albert Su says since the protests began, bus companies have lost 30 to 40 percent of passengers due to route diversions and cancellations. That in turn has led to a 20 percent jump in commuters taking the MTR, which he said has reached breaking point. Eastern District Officer M. Tang said a 15-minute journey home for Taihang residents from North Point now takes over two hours. But when asked about the exact number of complaints, she said it's hard to quantify. Home Affairs Under Secretary Florence Hui urged protesters to stop occupying the roads, adding that the government sincerely wants to end the crisis. At least 35 people have been injured in Japan, which is being battered by Typhoon Fong Fong. Over in India, at least two people have died and hundreds of thousands evacuated as a powerful cyclone sweeps through the Bay of Bengal. Joyce Wu reports. As India braced itself for the impact of Cyclone Hudhud, waves crashed against the country's eastern shore. Strong gusts uprooted trees and knocked out power. 
where the officials say the cyclone will only pick up speed until it makes landfall. The Global Disaster Alert and Coordination System, run by the United Nations and the European Commission, has forecast wind speeds of up to 212 km per hour, making it capable of inflicting catastrophic damage. At least 100,000 people were forced to flee their homes as the cyclone approached, threatening to devastate farmland and fishing villages. The Indian Ocean is a cyclone hotspot. Cyclones in the Bay of Bengal are common around this time of year, often causing mass evacuations and damage to crops and property. Heavy wind and rain continue to pelt Okinawa and Japan. Japan's strongest storm so far this year has injured dozens of people, with gusts of up to 234 kilometers per hour. Authorities have issued evacuation recommendations to 64,000 households across the prefecture, fearing damage from high sea, floods and wind. Officials have also issued landslide warnings. In Naha, most flights out of the airport have been cancelled today, following a full-day closure yesterday. The typhoon made landfall on Okinawa early today and then headed towards the nation's main island. Von Fong, which means wasp in Cantonese, is the second typhoon to hit Japan this week and is forecast to weaken to a tropical storm tomorrow. Joyce Wu, ATV News. Rebels in eastern Ukraine are calling for an end to the relentless bombing by government forces that breaks a ceasefire deal. But first, in our international roundup, three more people in Spain are suspected of having contracted Ebola. Joyce Wu reports. Global panic over the spread of Ebola shows no signs of slowing. Britain held a nationwide Ebola response exercise to test the country's readiness to deal with an outbreak of the deadly virus. The eight-hour exercise measured people's responsiveness and decontamination services. Meanwhile, over in Spain, three more people have been hospitalized in Madrid and are being monitored for signs of Ebola after a nurse was diagnosed with the deadly disease. 44-year-old Teresa Romero is still in a serious but stable condition, officials say. The latest outbreak of the disease has already killed more than 4,000 people, mostly in West Africa. There was better news in Brazil, where officials say a man under observation in Rio tested negative for the virus. The leader of the self-proclaimed Donetsk People's Republic has called for military activity to seize in eastern Ukraine. Alexander Zakachenko says a regime of silence should be introduced immediately. A ceasefire agreed weeks ago is routinely broken, with the separatist rebels and Ukrainian military blaming each other for breaking it. Some areas of Donetsk are shelled by the government almost every day. More than 3,600 people have been killed since the violence erupted in April. On average, 10 people are killed every day. For the second straight night, hundreds of protesters in Ferguson, Missouri, marched to the city's police station to protest the death of unarmed teenager Michael Brown after he was shot by a policeman. Fresh protests over the fatal shooting took place just days after an off-duty officer in nearby St. Louis shot and killed another black teen. The demonstrators chanted in front of a line of officers in riot gear as part of a weekend of action against police violence. Joyce Wu, ATV News. Time now for sports with Bo Lang. And it was the annual harbour race this morning. That's right, and around 2,000 swimmers took the plunge. A Hong Kong swimmer took the honours in the women's international race, and the men's event was won by a member of the Singapore national swimming team. The cooler morning weather was near perfect as participants warmed up before taking the plunge. Around 2,000 swimmers turned up to take part in this year's cross harbour swim from Lei Yun Mun Pier to Quarry Bay. <laughs> Acting Chief Secretary Matthew Jung sounded the horn, signalling the start of the 1.5 kilometre race. Safety was boosted this year and a tow float was given to each swimmer in the leisure group to increase their visibility to lifeguards. Singapore's Brandon Boom was first to cross the finish line in the men's international class. 
The 20-year-old, a member of his country's national swim team, won in 16 minutes and 43.1 seconds. Today the, the current was uh, quite, quite strong. The, yeah, the wave was also quite, uh, quite big, but uh, fortunately I managed to overcome both the waves and all the current and uh, finish the race, so yeah, quite uh, happy for, I'm quite happy with that. The women's race was won by Hong Kong's Chan Cheng Man in a time of 17 minutes and 16 seconds. Keith Sin is the new men's open champion. The 19-year-old clocked a time of 16 minutes and 48.7 seconds. 17-year-old Fiona Chan was the fastest in the women's category with a time of 16 minutes and 56.2 seconds. The annual event was launched in 1906 but scrapped in 1978 because of pollution and dirty water.